Well, I'm John Eckenrode. I'm the director of the Family Life Development Center, and it's, uh, I really welcome you here today on behalf of the center to the annual John Doris Lecture. And it's really my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker to you today, Dr. Gilbert Botvin. Uh, he's standing very close to me so that the, he, I can pick up the mic here, but, uh, but we are friends, too. So. <laughs> I, I didn't want anyone to get the wrong idea. <laughs> I didn't want to get too close. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Gil um, before I turn the mic over to him. Um, he is a, a fellow member of the Cornell faculty in the, in the city, being a profes uh, professor of psychology in the departments of both public health but also in psychiatry at Weill Medical College. He also directs the Institute for Prevention and Research there. Uh, he received his PhD uh, from Columbia in, with training in both uh, developmental psychology and clinical psychology. He's an internationally known uh, expert for his uh, pioneering work in the field of substance abuse prevention. Uh, he's been a prolific author, authored over 250 articles and chapters, and has been the recipient of numerous federal grants to support his work, too many for me to, to, uh, to document this, morning, this afternoon. Among his many awards, I'll just mention one, in 1995 he was awarded a prestigious merit award from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, and for those of you who know Merit Awards, these are only given to the most uh, uh, productive of the federally funded uh, researchers in the NIH, so that's, it's a distinct honor. He has contributed to many scholarly areas, but is perhaps most widely known for his work on prevention efforts in school-based settings, having developed a life skills training program which was tested and found to be effective in multiple randomized clinical trials, which I'm sure he'll talk some about today. Often, as we know, evidence-based programs do not extend beyond the research and development phase, with developers not really being able to establish an effective dissemination infrastructure after those efficacy trials. In contrast, uh, Dr. Botvin has ex excelled in that regard as well. He is founder and president of National Health Promotion Associates, which markets the life skills program, which is now perhaps the most widely used drug uh, abuse prevention programs used in schools today. His recent NIDA-funded research on models of effective diffusion of evidence-based programs also involves some of our colleagues here at Cornell. Bill uh, Trochum has worked with uh, Gill, as well as Don Tobias in Extension. So uh, it's been a, a lot of fun working with him and having our colleagues work with him. Uh, let me say that uh, Gill has also contributed widely to the field of prevention research generally. He's a, the past president of the Society for Prevention Research. And he was also the inaugural editor of what has now become a very influential journal, Prevention Science. And he's also served as a consultant on several federal agencies and members, and has been a member of many influential committees and, and panels. I just want to say a minute about why this is a particular, uh, take a minute to say why this is a particularly opportune time to have Gil visit with us and, and give us, uh, uh, talk about his work. As some of you may know, over the next, over the coming months, uh, the Family Life Development Center is going to be merging with the Bronfenbrenner Life Course Center uh, to be a new center called the Bronfenbrenner Center for Translational Research. Uh, more to come on that. There'll be announcements and events and so forth in the coming months. Uh, translational research involves many approaches, multiple approaches to the utilization of research knowledge uh, for the development of innovative programs and practices to benefit children, youth, and adults. But also, uh, it involves practices to uh, improve uh, the translation of, of practice-based wisdom to back to the research process. So it's kind of a circular process. This character actually characterizes much of the work of the two centers over the years, but we'll be seeking now to add some new and innovative programs and approaches to our efforts. And we also anticipate that this new center will embody a, a new vision or an updated vision of the college's outreach efforts generally. Our center will indeed complement the work that's going on in the city in the biomedical and clinical areas with the clinical and translational science center. So we look forward to working with folks in the city at the medical college as well. So with that background, I mean, Dr. Uh, Botvin's work is very much in keeping with the mission of our new center. So we're thrilled to have him here today. And I'd like to have you all join me in welcoming the guild to Cornell, up to the upstate part of the campus, and to the college. So thanks for coming. Uh, John, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. 
Uh, it's great to be here uh, up in Ithaca. I've been back and forth uh, a fair amount over the past uh, year. I've got a daughter who's a senior here uh, at Cornell, uh, a nutrition science major. Um, I couldn't quite influence her to do exactly what, uh, what I do in, in prevention, but nutrition uh, is close enough. So I'm uh, thrilled with that. It's great to be here. Uh, what I'm going to be doing today uh, is talking about the work that we've done um, at uh, Weill Medical College uh, uh, in the Department of Public Health in the division that I run, uh, which is the Division of Prevention uh, and Health Behavior. Uh, I'm going to talk about the work that we've done in the area of uh, tobacco, alcohol, and drug abuse prevention, uh, the extent to which uh, that work uh, has broadened to include, uh, include other uh, health compromising behaviors. Uh, I'm going to summarize some of the work that we've done uh, over the last uh, 30 years now, it's been nearly 30 years, uh, and, uh, and then talk about uh, how this uh, leads naturally, that kind of um, experimental work leads quite naturally uh, to uh, work in translational research and the kinds of things uh, that John and his group up here uh, are interested in. Uh, and uh, the group at the Medical Center, the Translational Research Center uh, at Weill Cornell, are interested in, in the area of biomedical uh, research. Uh, let me say a word or two about how I ended up uh, going down this path uh, in life. Uh, like many things in life, uh, there is a fair amount of uh, serendipity involved uh, in, in getting to where I am today. You all know what serendipity is, by the way. Uh, that's uh, when you're looking for a needle in the haystack and instead you find the winning ticket to the New York lottery. Or better, maybe uh, you find uh, um, a free ticket to the Harvard uh, Cornell hockey game. I know last time I was up here, they were in short supply. So I ended up uh, down this path coming out of Columbia, not uh, knowing exactly what I wanted to do, but having an interest both uh, uh, in clinical and in developmental psychology. Uh, and it turns out I ended up getting a job at a place called the American Health Foundation, which was started by Ernst Winder. Ernst Winder is a very interesting uh, guy. He uh, spent about 25 years at Memorial Sloan Kettering and is one of the first people credited with finding the link between uh, cigarette smoking uh, and lung cancer. He started a, an institution called the American Health Foundation, and I end up working there right out of graduate school, still wet behind the ears uh, with a freshly minted PhD, uh, and began to work uh, in what came to be uh, the area of uh, health promotion and disease prevention. It goes by many different names now. It's called preventive medicine, behavioral medicine, uh, and so forth. Uh, but uh, when I first arrived on the scene at the American Health Foundation, having little experience in this area, um, I was told by, uh, by Dr. Winder, listen, I want to give you a job that everybody else before you has failed at. I want you to develop an effective smoking prevention program. And here I am, fresh out of graduate school, my very first job, and you can imagine what I thought. I thought, oh my heavens. I better look for another job. I'm in deep trouble. And so uh, I looked at the literature, and sure enough, it was a disaster. Almost everything before had been unsuccessful. Um, so uh, I did what uh, I was trained to do in graduate school. I began to look more broadly at the literature to look at the extent to which we knew something about the etiology uh, of uh, cigarette smoking. Uh, and there was very little uh, literature available at that time, but there were cer certain leads in the literature which eventually led, led me to uh, a conceptualization of the problem uh, which uh, eventuated in developing uh, the intervention uh, that John mentioned, the Life Skills Training Program. So I'm going to talk about uh, our work with the Life Skills Training Program uh, and uh, talk about, in general, uh, advances that have been made in prevention science over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. I, I say 30 years. I know you're all saying to yourself, 30 years, how is it possible this guy looks so young? <laughs> he couldn't have been doing this for 30 years. I started at an early age. This is, uh, by the way, a picture of uh, um, our Department of Public Health. Our chairman right, is right here in the middle. There's a picture of me on the end there uh, with my uh, colleague and collaborator, uh, Ken Griffin uh, on the side. 
the kind of work that we're currently doing in our, in our division um, and, and within the, the institute, it focuses uh, in its broadest possible way on uh, health promotion and disease prevention. But over the years, uh, necessarily, uh, our uh, emphasis has been uh, somewhat narrower, and it stems from my early days at the American Health Foundation and the charge that Ernst Winder gave me to develop an effective smoking prevention program. So my initial focus uh, was on uh, cigarette smoking and smoking prevention, and then over the years it broadened to include alcohol uh, and drug use. So in our group we've been interested over the years in uh, the epidemiology and the etiology of uh, substance use behavior, adolescent substance use behavior, and developing uh, effective intervention approaches. We also have work uh, ongoing in the area of violence and delinquency prevention. Uh, Ken Griffin is doing work in HIV risk uh, behavior. Uh, uh, Jennifer Epstein uh, has been doing work in uh, suicide uh, prevention and also uh, recently uh, uh, with internet use and health risk behaviors. She just had a paper uh, accepted to addictive behaviors looking at internet, internet use and uh, alcohol use among adolescents. Uh, and then, of course, we're doing work uh, most recently uh, in the uh, uh, exciting new area of translational uh, research. Let me start out by sort of um, framing uh, the issue of prevention. What do we mean by prevention? Prevention over the years has had two, um, two conceptualizations. The traditional classification or uh, system that was used to describe prevention was primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. So, in that framework, what we do is primary prevention, focusing on um, a population before a problem has developed. So trying to deal with uh, the, er the area of cigarette smoking um, with kids at a point where most kids um, have not begun to smoke cigarettes. And then also, um, in about 1994, there was a recognition that that conceptualization of prevention was perhaps uh, not as clear as it could be. And particularly because there was overlap uh, between uh, tertiary prevention, for example, and treatment, and it, beca it became rather murky as to what was treatment and what was prevention. So um, the Institute of Medicine developed this uh, classification uh, of the continuum of care, uh, where over on the left side there's universal, selective, and uh, indicated uh, prevention, and that's defined by the populations that uh, uh, are targeted. Universal prevention approaches target the general population. So for example, a school-based universal prevention program would target all the kids in the school. A selective intervention targets a subset of the population who are considered to be at high risk. Uh, indicated programs are for those individuals who already are at high risk or um, exhibiting some, um, some indicators uh, of a, uh, a particular a disorder or problem. So most of our the world that we inhabit, the neighborhood that we live in, is really pretty much down here, although uh, we've uh, begun doing some work in these other areas. As I started to say uh, at the outset when I was talking about Ernst Winder in my early days at the American Health Foundation and the focus on uh, cigarette smoking, of the various uh, forms of substance use that we're interested in, cigarette smoking uh, is extremely important for many reasons. Most obviously, from a public health perspective, uh, cigarette smoking is important uh, because it is uh, the number one premature cause of death and disability in the United States today, with uh, well over 400,000 deaths occurring each and every year. Worldwide, the problem is even bigger. Over a billion people smoke cigarettes. Uh, we know right now that it seems to be falling in high-income countries, which has generally been the pattern in the United States going from the 1950s, where roughly half of the population smoked in the United States, to the present day, where only about 20% of the population smokes. But it's also uh, been rising in low- and middle-income countries throughout the world. Overall, as I said, in the U.S., over 400,000 uh, deaths occur annually that are attributable to cigarette smoking. Worldwide, uh, it's estimated that cigarette smoking kills uh, 5 million annually, and it's projected to increase by the year 2030 to between 8 and 10 million people. Uh, so this is a huge problem. So that's one of the reasons that we're very interested in cigarette smoking uh, it's also important to know that uh, 
that cigarette smoking occurs uh, in the beginning of the developmental progression of substance use, tobacco and alcohol use. This slide shows uh, past 30-day uh, use uh, among uh, 12th graders. Um, from uh, what used to be called the high school senior survey, it's now called monitoring the future because they now collect data from uh, eighth and tenth graders as well as twelfth graders. But you can see this overall pattern uh, which just shows data from the 1990s uh, until uh, 2009. But generally uh, cigarette smoking uh, uh, peaked uh, during this time frame uh, around 1996-97 and has dropped um, Alcohol uh, abuse, uh, that is, uh, instances of being drunk, uh, has stayed uh, fairly elevated. Uh, marijuana use uh, has uh, risen, um, plateaued, and then seems to be converging, as you can see in this slide, uh, with uh, cigarette smoking. And then other forms of illicit drug use uh, are uh, substantially below that in terms of their prevalence rates. So it's clear from a, um, a public health point of view, again, that tobacco and alcohol are two huge problems in terms of mortality and morbidity. Uh, and also, as I in indicated, that they are part of a developmental progression that typically starts uh, in kids, uh, usually during the um, pre-adolescent years, with uh, alcohol uh, and or tobacco, and then moving on to marijuana, which is usually the first illicit substance used and then on to other uh, illicit substances. But the use of other illicit substances, again, is dramatically lower uh, than the use of uh, the top three. Now, doing uh, part of the progression, an interesting thing occurs with respect to inhalant use. Inhalant use peaks uh, around uh, the ninth grade uh, and then drops off. So it defies this pattern where uh, typically people start at one level with one substance and the prevalence rate in society goes up until it plateaus and reaches the level of uh, the prevalence rate in the adult population. Um, with inhalant use, it has a very different pattern where it rises quickly uh, and then uh, drops it at the, the ninth grade. So inhalant use isn't something that we uh, have uh, particularly focused on uh, for a variety of reasons uh, and uh, it, it's not on the, this slide. Let me say a word um, about uh, the prevention research uh, process. I borrowed this uh, uh, from uh, Rick Price uh, at the University of Michigan a number of years ago, and it's very similar to the NIH uh, model of uh, prevention research, uh, or uh, research in general. As applied to prevention, um, research typically starts with an effort to uh, understand the etiology of the problem, in this case, understanding the risk and protective factors. Um, once you've identified risk and protective factors, to identify a subset that are potentially modifiable, uh, and then to develop um, interventions, uh, pilot test those interventions, uh, and then once they've been uh, found to be acceptable to the population, they, they've found to um, be feasible, they've been found to uh, be potentially efficacious, uh, then to move forward with larger scale uh, randomized trials. Uh, but after that, down here um, is uh, where things get interesting, where there's a focus on diffusion research, i.e. translational research. Now what's happened um, with the area of prevention is we've actually cycled through this uh, several times, particularly the, the first uh, three of these uh, from the top left to the top right to the bottom right down here to diffusion research uh, with different populations. But uh, as we continue to do research, we, we continue doing research in all of these areas, uh, but uh, there's a great deal of interest, of course, uh, in uh, uh, translational research. The kind of um, research agenda that uh, we developed early on um, at Weill Cornell Medical College first started by trying to understand uh, the causes of tobacco, alcohol, and illicit, illicit drug use, trying to develop effective interventions, trying to demonstrate, if possible, that some interventions work. Because remember, I said at the outset that the literature was really uh, just littered with failures, uh, studies uh, demonstrating that most prevention efforts didn't work, uh, most prevention approaches used in schools were ineffective, 
And so the field was at a crisis about 25 or so years ago, where essentially it was widely recognized that nothing worked. So there was a real question about whether we could develop an intervention that would be uh, effective and we could demonstrate that uh, in a, um, a well-designed uh, and well-executed study. Then the question, once you could demonstrate that, the question would be, well, if you have effects, uh, initial effects, short-term effects, how long do the effects last? Do you produce durable uh, effects or not? Um, then related to this, at that point in time, cigarette smoking was uh, seen to be a separate problem from alcohol and illicit drug use. And it wasn't until maybe um, five or ten years after that, I would say in the mid-80s, that there was a recognition that this was part of a, uh, a larger uh, syndrome of uh, behaviors and that tobacco, alcohol, and uh, illicit drug use did really belong together uh, and had many common uh, etiologic uh, factors and the developmental progression in fact uh, meshed together and therefore it made sense in developing interventions not to develop as had been done in the past separate interventions for each one of these uh, in the form typically of smoking uh, or tobacco education but instead to develop integrated approaches that might have the potential of impacting on all of these. The next issue that uh, we're interested in thinking about and testing is do the effects generalize to other kinds of health behaviors? Um, or if you slightly modify the intervention, could you have an impact on other uh, health risk behaviors? Uh, next, uh, we're interested in the extent to which it might work with a variety of populations. Uh, these studies were initially conducted with predominantly white middle class populations. Uh, subsequently, uh, there was a focus on uh, testing the effectiveness of these interventions on, uh, on uh, inner city minority uh, youth. Once you've demonstrated that a prevention approach works or, or any kind of intervention works, and you've demonstrated it works with more than one population, uh, of course, the next interesting question uh, from a theoretical point of view is, well, why does it work? Um, what are the mediating mechanisms? What's the theory uh, underlying this? And then finally, um, can you uh, effectively disseminate these programs, move them from uh, the world of research into the, uh, into the real world, and ultimately have an impact uh, on public health? In those early days, the approaches that were taken to uh, attempt to prevent uh, cigarette smoking focused initially on providing health information. Um, most of those uh, programs uh, that were knowledge-based made the assumption essentially that kids who smoked cigarettes just didn't know any better. They didn't have the information, they didn't have the facts, and if you would provide them with sufficient factual information, they would make a logical and well-informed and well-reasoned decision not to smoke cigarettes. Well, it turns out that that's not the case. Uh, and that there are many other factors that play a role uh, in promoting uh, behaviors like cigarette smoking. Uh, so it's not too surprising that health information uh, alone was not effective. And it's also the case that most studies found that by the time the kids reached the seventh grade, that more than 90%, in fact, close to 98% of all the kids were fully cognizant of the fact that cigarette smoking was dangerous for their health. Now, one of the things that occurred to me uh, uh, that, um, that I encountered, let me put it that way, earlier uh, in my career when I was at the American Health Foundation that helped me to understand how unimportant health information was uh, as a single uh, intervention strategy uh, was uh, I'm, uh, when I met a person at the American Health Foundation who was an epidemiologist there uh, and who probably knew more about the uh, adverse health consequences of cigarette smoking than anybody else in the country. She was a colleague of uh, Dr. Ernst Winders, uh, wrote many articles with him, uh, but I was shocked to find out one day when I walked outside that she was smoking a cigarette. She was a cigarette smoker. And I, and I talked to her and I said, why are you smoking cigarettes? You, you know that this is not good for your health. And she said, you know, that's really true. I know it's not good for my health but I've developed this habit, I've become a cigarette smoker over the years, uh, and I found it extremely 
difficult to quit. And she continued to smoke cigarettes in the face of all the evidence that smoking was hazardous uh, to her health. The use uh, of scare tactics, fear arousal approaches uh, that have been commonly used in the case of cigarette smoking, showing people blackened lungs, or um, as is often the case before proms. In fact, this time of year is to show kids uh, the aftermath of uh, what happens when you drink and drive. These things uh, you know, can, are dramatic. They'll capture your attention. But uh, uh, here again, there's little um, empirical evidence that those kinds of approaches are effective. The two most promising approaches, going back to the uh, early 80s, um, fell into these categories. First, one that focused on social influences, recognizing uh, that most kids who smoke cigarettes, and indeed most kids who use other substances, uh, it turns out, have friends who engage in the same behaviors. And so uh, starting with the work of Richard Evans um, a number of years ago, um, he was the first one to find that you could develop a preventive intervention uh, that was effective in preventing cigarette smoking by targeting the social influences that were posited to play a role in uh, the smoking onset process. And that first study, that first success, uh, stimulated uh, a floodgate of research uh, around the United States and also stimulated a lot of funding from NIH. Uh, for this kind of research funding uh, that helped to move the field of smoking prevention along and along with it moved uh, uh, the field of uh, alcohol and drug abuse prevention uh, as well. Another approach uh, is the competence enhancement approach. Uh, one that uh, incorporates many aspects of the social influence approach but also uh, emphasizes uh, the development of positive um, social and personal self-management skills. Um, you know, in a word, youth development. But putting together a prevention approach that in a very structured way was designed to promote uh, individual uh, competence skills. This uh, provides the general uh, components, the major components of the social influence approach, which included at that point in time uh, psychological inoculation, uh, included uh, something called normative education, which uh, really means trying to correct the misperception that um, most people smoke uh, and trying to correct uh, the norms, uh, if you will, in a, in a smoking, in a school or a local environment. Um, something called public commitment, where uh, the researchers uh, would have kids come up to the front of the room and make a public commitment not to smoke. So sort of go on the record, I'm not going to be a cigarette smoker. Uh, and then teaching them a set of resistance skills or refusal skills, skills that they could use, for example, to resist offers to smoke uh, cigarettes. Um, what Nancy Reagan infamously uh, or infamously called, uh, you know, just say no. That was based on some reasonably good science at the time showing that you could teach resistance skills or refusal skills to kids. But of course, in prevention, you needed to do much more than simply uh, teach kids to just say no. Now, these kinds of approaches, uh, when tested and applied across the board to tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana, showed initial reductions uh, in the range of uh, 20 uh, to 40 or 45 percent, with most studies falling in the range of 30 to 45 percent, with effects lasting typically only about 18 months or two years. Uh, there are one or two studies showing effects lasting for as long as five years. The strongest effects have been demonstrated using peer leaders, for example, work done by Cheryl Perry and her uh, colleagues uh, at the University of Minnesota at that point in time. Um, there's uh, some evidence, although it's limited with minority youth, uh, and there are a number of important researchers who have been working this area, Evans. Uh, the first one I mentioned, um, Phyllis Ellickson at RAND, uh, David Murray, who's now at Ohio State, uh, Marianne Pence, and uh, Cheryl Perry. Now, the competence enhancement uh, approach uh, um, it has been used and tested by several uh, researchers and several programs use that uh, approach. Let me just sort of pick one at random, just out of, the, out of the blue. Talk about the life skills training program, a good example, a good exemplar of the competence enhancement approach. Um, the general uh, strategy here is, it, it, 
really embodies three major um, components, the drug resistance uh, component, which also focuses on normative education, um, a personal self-management uh, component, and a general social skills uh, training uh, component. This is a general conceptualization uh, or uh, model, for those of you who like models, that shows uh, how the life skills training program uh, is designed to have an impact on personal competence skills, social skills, uh, and uh, domain-specific skills that uh, relate to uh, utilizing um, resistance or refusal skills to resist uh, pressures to smoke, drink, uh, and use drugs. The, the drug resistance uh, component focuses on trying to increase awareness of uh, the influences to use drugs, uh, focuses on uh, teaching kids, as I mentioned, anti-drug use norms or correcting the misperception that everybody's doing it, uh, and teaching a set of general uh, refusal or resistance skills. The self-management component uh, teaches general problem-solving and decision-making skills in a fairly straightforward and simplified way teaching kids a personal behavior change technology, a set of skills they can use to tackle uh, problems if they uh, are interested in um, becoming a better student or a better athlete. They learn how to set a goal, break it down into a series of smaller uh, short-term goals, uh, reinforce uh, themselves for their successes, and, and move towards uh, achieving uh, uh, each goal uh, sequentially, step by step, uh, through successive approximation. Uh, and then uh, teaching kids general stress and anxiety management uh, skills. Also, uh, as I uh, indicated, general social skills, communication skills, greetings uh, and brief social exchanges, uh, which are particularly important uh, for kids when they want to uh, meet new people as they move from one school to another, they move into a new school, they go from elementary school to middle school, uh, or from uh, junior high school to high school, conversational skills, complementing skills, uh, and uh, assertive skills. Now, the general structure uh, of uh, the life skills training program as it uh, interfaces with the school environment uh, is laid out in this slide. For middle schools, uh, the focus would be on sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, where the first year of intervention would occur in the sixth grade. Uh, and with booster interventions in the seventh and eighth grade. Uh, in junior high, where most of our early research took place, the focus uh, initially was on the seventh grade with uh, booster sessions in the eighth and ninth grade. Uh, as the program is currently constituted, it consists of 15 class periods in the first year, 10 in the second year, and five class periods uh, in the third year. Uh, we and others testing this approach or similar approaches have tested its uh, effectiveness with different kinds of program providers, uh, regular uh, school-based health educators, prevention specialists, uh, um, peer leaders, uh, and uh, you know, regular uh, uh, classroom teachers. Um, the most practical program provider for a program like this uh, is uh, either a health educator um, or a, 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 you know, a regular teacher who has an interest in prevention uh, and either teaching the program alone or in combination with peer leaders. Peer leader programs are effective, as Cheryl Perry and her group has demonstrated, uh, but uh, they're difficult to sustain and they take you know, a lot of uh, adult effort and supervision to sustain them. Um, but they, they can be uh, utilized uh, in a way that's effective. In this kind of prevention approach, uh, it's not just important uh, to have the right kind of content uh, in the intervention, so uh, domain-specific material that relates to the problem of interest, tobacco, alcohol, or, or uh, illicit drug use, as well as generic skills training, but also the way in which you implement the program, the way in which the program uh, is taught. It needs to use uh, interactive uh, teaching skills that can facilitate class discussion, uh, or um, that relate to uh, skills training and providing reinforcement uh, for learning those skills and opportunities that are structured by the teacher, both with respect to in-class uh, practice uh, and uh, out-of-class practice via uh, behavioral homework assignments. Now, in our group uh, at Wild Cornell, um, we've conducted uh, well over 30 studies published in uh, peer-reviewed journals, 
demonstrating the short-term uh, effect of this kind of prevention program in our early work, um, intermediate and longer-term effects. We've demonstrated its effectiveness uh, in studies with white uh, suburban middle-class kids, with white inner-city kids, with uh, minority inner-city kids, with uh, separate studies focusing on African-American uh, youth uh, and uh, on uh, Hispanic uh, youth. Um, as well as studies that really uh, involve, as is typically the case in New York City, uh, multi-ethnic uh, uh, groupings of, of kids. So this kind of prevention approach has been tested across the board with various populations. Um, it's been demonstrated to be effective uh, with uh, tobacco, alcohol, and uh, illicit drug use, uh, as well as with some other health behaviors, and I'll talk about that in a minute. In a minute. And in addition to our research group, uh, there's also been uh, independent uh, replication of this uh, by a few groups. I don't expect you to read this. This just sort of gives you a sense of the databases and the studies that we've conducted. The studies uh, started out with uh, small-scale pilot studies um, back in uh, the, uh, the early 80s uh, with uh, two or 300 kids. Uh, and all the way up to studies involving uh, anywhere from three to 5,000 kids attending uh, 50 or 56 schools uh, uh, in New York State. From a methodological point of view, um, in order to demonstrate that prevention uh, work, that preventive interventions were effective, it's important that studies be well designed and they, um, that they clear a reasonably high methodological bar, and that typically involves uh, not only uh, conducting randomized trials, uh, but in, in these kinds of school-based studies, uh, you typically have cluster ram randomization where you're either randomizing whole schools to conditions or classrooms within schools. Uh, most of our work has really involved randomly assigning uh, entire schools uh, to um, one condition or another. It's important to uh, collect data in a way that underscores or emphasizes um, high quality data and that uh, will give you reason to believe that the data are highly valid. Uh, we use uh, IDs uh, coded on the questionnaire so we can track individual students over time. In some of our studies, we've now tracked kids uh, not only through high school, but we've tracked them after high school uh, into their 20s and we have one group of kids we're now trying to track uh, in their early 30s. It's important to make sure that uh, uh, you test for pretest equivalence uh, and demonstrate that you don't have uh, significant pretest differences uh, or that you don't have differential attrition or data loss and that you use uh, uh, analytic approaches uh, that are appropriate uh, for this kind of uh, research. Uh, and often that means uh, mixed model approaches or approaches that take into account uh, the ICCs or the intracluster correlations as well as other relevant uh, covariates. This is a, a slide that just shows the kind of uh, form that we use, and we just generically refer to this as a student health survey. In our earliest uh, research, we uh, demonstrated uh, rather uh, strong effects on tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana uh, in a series of studies in the early 80s uh, where we were able to demonstrate uh, that we could cut uh, tobacco use uh, or other forms of substance use uh, in half, uh, and in some cases by as much as 87 percent when you compare the group receiving the prevention program to the control group. We also found that uh, over time, um, without ongoing intervention, there would be an erosion of the prevention effects, and therefore uh, it was clear that you needed uh, some kind of booster intervention or ongoing intervention. This slide uh, nicely makes the point uh, with respect to the importance of uh, some kind of booster sessions. Uh, and both of these slides, uh, in both of these uh, series of bars, the uh, uh, kids had the prevention program, the life skills training program in the seventh grade, uh, in uh, the, uh, uh, and then uh, the group in the uh, blue bar had it both in the seventh and the eighth grade. They had two years of intervention compared with the group in the yellow bar that had only one year of intervention and uh, the gray bar, which is the control condition. So even though we still had significant program effects after um, a year, that booster sessions not only helped to maintain those effects, but in this case actually enhanced the prevention effects. 
We've, as I mentioned, looked at uh, the longer term impact of this approach uh, with various populations. Uh, and you can see in the series of uh, these bars um, with uh, weekly smoking in terms of uh, white uh, uh, middle class kids, uh, minority kids, uh, daily smoking in terms of our, our white sample, and uh, daily smoking in terms of minority youth. And those reductions, uh, you know, anyway, range between uh, 20 and 28%. Now keep in mind that figure that I gave you at the very uh, outset, with over 400,000 deaths each and every year in the United States. Uh, if you could scale up a prevention program like this, an intervention of this kind, um, and implement it across the country, and you could produce a 25% reduction, which we've been able to demonstrate in a study we published in JAMA, following kids until the very end of high school. Um, that means that from a public health perspective, you would have the potential of saving 100,000 lives. So this kind of a uh, preventive intervention from a public health point of view can have a tremendous um, population benefit. But of course, you have to deal with the many challenges that come uh, from trying to take a, an intervention like this to scale. These are some additional slides that show prevention effects uh, with uh, multiple substances, polydrug use, narcotic use, hallucinogen use, uh, illicit drug use. Uh, this uh, slide uh, shows a study where we looked at uh, binge drinking, kids who drank five or more drinks uh, on one drinking occasion, which is the standard definition for kids. I know that wouldn't apply here to Cornell, probably, right? What would be the appropriate measure? Well, no one wants to volunteer that. A couple of six packs. So anyway, binge drinking, uh, where you drink a lot on one occasion, but uh, which is a pattern that occurs with uh, kids as they uh, get to the end of high school, and it's certainly characteristic of kids drinking in college, uh, where they're not drinking every day, but drinking a lot on any particular occasion. This is a study that was done by Dick Spoth and his colleagues uh, at the University of Iowa, published in the Archives of Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine, that looked at the impact of uh, uh, the life skills training program uh, alone or in combination with a family prevention approach, and again showing that it can uh, reduce, in this case, uh, methamphetamine use uh, by about half. We also uh, conducted some research funded by uh, NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, to look at uh, the extent to which this kind of prevention approach might have an impact on uh, uh, violence and delinquency. And this uh, slide from a study that was published in uh, Prevention Science shows uh, reductions in uh, various kinds of aggressive behavior, delinquency, uh, and fighting. Uh, so suggesting that this kind of approach uh, might well have uh, potential applicability to a, a fairly broad range of health compromising behaviors. Another finding uh, that we uh, came upon quite uh, accidentally, uh, when we were trying to track kids, we needed to get access to uh, data from New York State's uh, uh, DMV database, uh, and uh, in working with uh, New York State, we, we got the data we needed to track the kids, but we also found that we had their driving uh, convictions uh, in that data that they gave us. Um, and um, we analyzed that data, and as it turns out, uh, that the intervention uh, also produced a significant reduction uh, in risky driving, as was measured in terms of the number of uh, points on someone's driving record, a 25% reduction. Um, and then um, the study that I mentioned where we followed kids for uh, um, up to 10 years uh, later in their early uh, 20s, uh, showing that we could reduce tobacco, alcohol, uh, and uh, illicit drug use. So kids who started out in the seventh grade receiving the prevention program, uh, following them up 10 years later in their early 20s. Uh, so there are very few studies like this uh, in the literature that demonstrate uh, not only that prevention uh, um, can work uh, with uh, different substances, different behaviors, different populations, but also that it produces effects uh, that are fairly durable. Now over time the effects do uh, decrease, um, but you still get uh, significant and measurable effects uh, uh, well into uh, uh, their 20s. So uh, by way of summary, uh, we've been able to demonstrate with the life skills training approach that we can cut substance use in half, uh, that uh, the effects last for up to 10 years. Uh, we've produced effects also on inhalants, uh, on narcotics, on 
uh, meth use, on the use of hallucinogens. We've demonstrated importantly with respect to cigarette smoking that it reduces pack-a-day cigarette smoking um, and uh, polysubstance use. And as I mentioned, we've demonstrated reductions in violence and delinquency behavior and, and risky driving. Um, and across the board, we've been able to show that we can have an impact with this kind of prevention program uh, on multiple populations. It's not a, a program that only works with uh, one population uh, or another. Uh, Steve Ose uh, in Washington State, uh, uh, researches at Penn State, uh, uh, among others, and I believe also Dick Spoth, uh, have also done cost-benefit analysis with uh, a range of prevention programs and found that this kind of prevention approach uh, produces a $25 benefit for uh, every dollar spent. So uh, it's uh, not only effective, but cost-effective. Okay. After many, many years of painstakingly designing, executing uh, these studies, uh, and uh, you know, studiously publishing in the peer-reviewed literature, uh, it's, it was clear that although we were having an impact on the state of the science, and we were having an impact on policymakers uh, in Washington, um, we were making you know, headway with congressional uh, staffers and so forth that in the real world we really were not having an impact uh, on uh, kids uh, uh, and we were not on track to have the kind of impact from a public health perspective that we hoped to have. Obviously it's great to develop uh, an effective intervention of any kind but unless it's used, and unless it's used on a large scale, you're not likely to derive um, a large scale public health benefit. So the next phase of research for us uh, that we've kind of now blundered into, it wasn't something we initially wanted to study, but as the intervention uh, began to um, become well known, uh, as uh, folks in, in Washington began to promote it, we began to move out in the field and begin, we began the process of taking this to scale, but then very quickly, um, you know, bloodied our noses, found that, uh, you know, the world was very different, um, the real world was very different than the world in which we conducted these randomized trials, and there were a whole new set of problems that we had to deal with. And, uh, of course, many of these uh, can be dealt with uh, uh, as research issues. So we are at the point in time where we have now developed uh, evidence-based uh, interventions in, in our field, evidence-based uh, tobacco, alcohol, and drug abuse prevention programs. Um, what's happened is that that term has had an impact probably most dramatically on the marketplace uh, and on people who are out marketing um, educational programs and prevention programs. And so although evidence-based programs themselves have been slow to be disseminated and uh, utilized, um, folks who market prevention programs were quick to appropriate the terms that we were using. Initially we called our programs research-based programs and then they were called subsequently science-based programs uh, and then evidence-based programs. And what you see is that folks who are marketing programs quickly, quickly um, will utilize these descriptions of what they're doing. So this tells uh, all of us what uh, we mean by evidence-based prevention. Evidence-based prevention is very simple. It means programs that have been tested uh, and proven to be effective. They're tested uh, using uh, well-designed randomized controlled trials that were uh, very carefully uh, executed. Rigorous research methods or well-accepted research methods were utilized. The appropriate uh, data analysis was used in all, almost all cases. Uh, they've been published in uh, peer-reviewed journals uh, and that they have uh, one or more uh, replications. On a federal level, there's, uh, as, an, as an effort to sort of promote the use of evidence-based uh, programs, practices, policies, um, a number of initiatives uh, were developed, one called the Blueprints Model that many of you uh, are familiar with. It was funded by uh, the Justice uh, Department's uh, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention um, and uh, was led by uh, Dell Elliott at the University of Colorado um, where they laid out a set of criteria that they used to identify evidence-based prevention programs. The National Institute on Drug Abuse weighed in uh, with uh, a set of uh, exemplar programs uh, indicating uh, uh, their thinking about uh, what constituted an evidence-based program. 
We now have a registry called NREP, uh, the National Registry uh, for Effective Programs and Policies that focuses both on the quality of the research uh, and readiness for dissemination. And that registry uh, is now being widely used and widely uh, disseminated. Um, and there's something called the Coalition for Evidence-Based Policy that John Barron and his group uh, has put together, designed to identify the very top tier, the very best of the best uh, in evidence-based uh, prevention program. David Old's uh, program uh, is on that list of top tier programs. And I'm happy to say our program, the Life Skills Training, is also on that list. And of course, the US Department of Education uh, put together a task force to identify um, exemplary and model uh, prevention programs that uh, they recommended schools use around the country. Now, we made tremendous progress early on in the field in terms of disseminating some of these programs while the, say, there was a lot of money from the Safe and Drug-Free Schools program within the Department of Education. At its peak, it peaked around uh, just a little over $600 million and uh, gradually has declined uh, over time um, to the point now where um, uh, it's largely been zeroed out. So there's very little funding available um, for school-based prevention uh, from that source, which had been a, uh, one of the major sources that schools uh, utilized. So not surprisingly, funding is a critical issue. Stable funding is a critical issue uh, for prevention. Uh, but there are other translational challenges uh, that can be addressed uh, with research. Uh, one very straightforward uh, challenge that other research groups, even though they had prevention programs that were evidence-based programs, they didn't produce standardized materials that uh, were uh, user-friendly, were attractive, uh, and that were uh, competitive with commercial materials that were out there in the marketplace. So there's the need uh, still for many programs to develop user-friendly uh, materials, attractive and user-friendly materials. There needs to be more of a prevention infrastructure uh, to um, support the dissemination of prevention programs to provide uh, technical assistance, to provide effective training. There needs to be research uh, focusing on developing effective training models. Uh, and uh, there needs to be uh, work in this overall prevention infrastructure that we need here in the United States to develop the an adequate training capacity to support uh, the um, dissemination of uh, evidence-based prevention programs. And then there are a lot of issues that relate to planning and scheduling, um, and particularly uh, implementation fidelity, which I'll say uh, a few words about right now. John, how are we doing on time? Um, well, take another five minutes. We can maybe go over a little bit. OK, let me, thank you. OK, now one of the um, biggest challenges that we've confronted uh, in trying to uh, um, move prevention forward to disseminate it uh, and take it to scale uh, refers to implementation fidelity. People uh, have defined fidelity in various ways in terms of exposure, adherence, uh, uh, the quality of implementation. It's very similar to uh, what our colleagues in medicine refer to as, uh, as compliance. What we began to see as programs were utilized uh, both uh, within the context of uh, randomized trials uh, and even more so uh, when they were implemented in the real world was that there were serious concerns about uh, implementation fidelity. Um, most groups, uh, when they conducted their randomized trials, really didn't examine the issue of fidelity. Uh, and uh, once they did, I mean, everyone was shocked to see that there, there was a, a continuum of uh, implementation fidelity from very low fidelity uh, with some teachers to extremely high fidelity uh, in others. And when programs were disseminated outside of the context of uh, research studies, uh, overall implementation fidelity was even more questionable and became even more of a concern. And so researchers and policymakers then uh, became extremely concerned about the issue of, of fidelity uh, as we began to try to ramp up and disseminate prevention programs. The concern was that we might raise everyone's expectations very high, that we had interventions that worked. But uh, once implemented in the real world because of concerns about fidelity, that they might not produce the uh, intended results. 
So let me say a word or two about fidelity. This slide makes uh, the uh, issue quite clearly, I think. Um, the gray bar shows uh, the control group. The yellow bar shows a group that received the life skills training program, but where there was low fidelity uh, by the teachers implementing the prevention program. Uh, and uh, the blue bar shows where it was high fidelity. And, and what you see is that, you, again, you, you, you see some evidence of effects uh, with low fidelity, but the, uh, there's relatively little difference between the low fidelity group and the control group, um, whereas you get the much stronger effects uh, from uh, the high fidelity group, as, as one might expect. So in, in this early research that we did, uh, it, it uh, not only caused us to be more attentive to the issue of fidelity in our subsequent work, but it also, I think, helped to alert uh, the rest of the folks in the field, that fidelity is something that really needed to be uh, taken quite seriously. And it, it's something that we needed to um, pursue as a researchable uh, question, um, you know, the extent to which we can uh, maximize fidelity. What are, the, what are the barriers to fidelity and how do you overcome or surmount those barriers? These are some of the, uh, the barriers that uh, that folks implementing prevention programs have told us uh, or that we've gleaned from focus groups. Uh, a lack of training and support for prevention programs, limited resources uh, and funding. Again, uh, overcrowding in the schools is a big problem. It's hard to implement a prevention program if uh, you know, the kids are hanging from the rafters or they, you, know, you have three kids uh, uh, at a desk. Uh, classroom management uh, difficulties in general uh, make it uh, problematic. Uh, if um, a program can't be implemented because uh, a teacher doesn't have control of the class, obviously uh, the program won't be implemented with very good fidelity. Uh, often teachers found that if they didn't pace themselves properly, there was insufficient time, or if classroom management difficulties um, consumed their time, uh, they wouldn't uh, be able to implement the program with sufficient uh, fidelity. And then, of course, uh, teachers tell us that they're uh, suffering from a burden of multiple uh, competing mandates, uh, many of them unfunded, increasingly unfunded mandates. Uh, in work that Dell Elliott uh, has done and in some uh, work that we've done recently, uh, it's clear that there are things that you can uh, do to improve fidelity. Um, in emphasizing the importance of fidelity uh, alone, just, just making it clear in the initial training or in a study that we did recently through just-in-time emails that were sent, sent out to uh, teachers. Uh, you can in, improve uh, fidelity by reminding them of the importance of fidelity. Make sure that, uh, that individuals implementing a prevention program understand the underlying theory of the prevention program. Describe the prevention approach uh, clearly so they understand uh, how, it, uh, uh, how it should be implemented. Make sure that you have uh, adequate uh, training of the program providers. As it turns out, in the real world, um, most teachers who implement programs don't go through a uh, structured uh, in-service training uh, for a particular prevention program. Um, and so training uh, is an important issue uh, that relates to fidelity. Um, we and others have found that if you monitor implementation, that monitoring uh, alone can help enhance uh, fidelity. And of course, uh, it's uh, important to provide support and technical assistance. But again, that raises the question, well, what kind of structures do you need uh, for doing all these things, particularly in terms of training, uh, support, and technical uh, assistance? One of the things that uh, we are only, I think, beginning to fully appreciate is that because there's been the appropriation of the, many of the terms that we use in the research arena by folks marketing prevention programs in the schools, uh, that uh, the school teachers and administrators who have to make decisions about what programs they select uh, don't fully appreciate the difference between you know, a real evidence-based prevention program and one that's not evidence-based. Uh, that, that, that the landscape is rather murky out there and that we have to do a better job of articulating the rationale for evidence-based uh, prevention, why it's important, why an evidence-based prevention program is more important uh, than one that's not evidence-based. That, that's, that's something we have to, uh, uh, I think, think about, and that's an area where more research is needed because we're just not doing a very good job there. 
There are a number of factors that seem to affect the adoption decisions, uh, issues that relate to the flexibility and feasibility of the preventive intervention, cost, the appeal of the program, uh, and of course its efficacy. There are a number of uh, stakeholders that are often involved in making these decisions. I mean, they're made often in schools by uh, committees. Um, it's critically important that there be some attention being, that's placed uh, on uh, planning uh, and capacity building um, before the initial training and, and definitely before an intervention uh, is mounted in a school. Uh, staff turnover is a big problem. It's often been the case uh, in our randomized trials as well as in other situations that uh, we've been involved in outside of our randomized trials that uh, teachers go through a training and a week or two after the training uh, some of the teachers you've trained get reassigned uh, and someone else is now assigned to implement the prevention program and that person now is untrained. So th this is uh, a problem that has to be dealt with. Teachers won't often utilize it. So TA can't be reactive, it has to be proactive, it's got to be feasible, it has to be easy for teachers to use, otherwise they won't avail themselves of uh, whatever TA uh, you uh, provide. And again, uh, on this slide, funding. Funding's critical to uh, sustainability. Um, I'm getting to the end. <laughs> um, so where we are as a field in, um, in uh, the area of prevention uh, is that we've developed a number of preventive intervention strategies in our particular uh, neck of the woods, uh, tobacco, alcohol, and drug abuse prevention strategies. Other workers have developed uh, strategies that are effective with uh, mental health problems, uh, uh, a whole host of, of, uh, of health compromising behaviors or health related problems. So we've achieved a great deal of success uh, and uh, the field of prevention science has really advanced rather uh, dramatically over the last uh, 25 years. But we now have to deal with uh, issues relating to translational research as I uh, foreshadowed at the outset. Uh, what we refer to uh, uh, as type two uh, translational research, there are um, others who have talked about many different uh, types of translational research. Uh, the, the one that the Society for Prevention Research uses uh, simply em embraces type one and type two. Research type one being uh, what folks uh, at Weill Cornell are focused on, which is from the bench to the bedside, uh, and uh, type two being uh, the work that we're interested in, which really involves taking an intervention that's been found to be effective uh, and then uh, uh, disseminating it, promoting the um, adoption, the um, effective uh, implementation, uh, and the sustained use uh, in a way that becomes institutionalized over time. So, the, two, the three major research priorities uh, for the prevention field right now uh, first involves identifying effective strategies and structures for promoting uh, the adoption and use of evidence-based uh, uh, interventions uh, or programs. Secondly, to identify strategies and structures for enhancing implementation quality while trying to, to uh, maintain uh, some degree of flexibility. Uh, because as Rogers uh, has uh, uh, underscored, we know that uh, without flexibility, people will tend to drop programs. So if a program is too rigid, uh, if um, the demands uh, to uh, implement a program um, are, um, are too strict and too structured, uh, then folks will tend to uh, use programs that appear to be more uh, flexible. So it's important to develop uh, approaches that promote high implementation quality while at the same time allowing uh, some degree of uh, flexibility. And finally, uh, to identify structures and strategies for building long-term uh, uh, institutionalization or sustainability. So these are the three broad areas uh, that all of us are now focused on uh, in the, the prevention field. And I want to end uh, by just mentioning, uh, as John did, uh, uh, in his introduction, um, a cross-campus project that we're doing uh, um, with folks here uh, uh, at Cornell Ithaca. Uh, my colleague and I uh, at Wild Cornell um, uh, are uh, leading the study, which is a collaborative, a collaborative systems approach for the diffusion of evidence-based prevention. It's a five-year uh, study funded uh, by uh, NIDA within NIH. 
I'm the principal investigator, uh, Ken uh, is a co-investigator, and then serving as uh, lead investigators uh, um, at the College of Human Ecology is uh, Bill Trochem uh, and uh, Don Tobias, uh, who is the executive director for uh, the Cooperative Extension uh, in New York City. So this is a very interesting study. The overall uh, goal, the overarching ultimate goal is to increase our understanding uh, of how to effectively promote the dissemination, adoption, implementation, and sustained utilization of evidence-based uh, drug abuse uh, prevention. So it has a very uh, lofty goal. Uh, we have uh, several specific games, uh, two uh, of which relate to collecting uh, data in focus groups and structured interviews that then are subjected to a technique that uh, Bill Trocham and his colleagues use called concept mapping to help us to understand um, the, uh, the barriers and how to overcome them or how to possibly overcome the barriers uh, to uh, um, dissemination, adoption, implementation, uh, and sustainability. Uh, and then to use some of those uh, techniques to develop uh, what we're calling an adaptive approach that can be tested against a standard fidelity-focused uh, approach in a randomized trial where we'll look at both the impact on fidelity, uh, look, uh, catalog the kinds of adaptations that are uh, made by uh, program providers uh, implementing the program, uh, and also uh, uh, test uh, its impact on uh, student um, tobacco, alcohol, uh, and uh, illicit drug use as well as uh, on other related student outcomes. So let me uh, just uh, end by saying that over the last 25 or 30 years, we've made uh, tremendous strides in the area of uh, prevention science. Uh, we've developed a number of uh, um, evidence-based prevention programs that have been carefully and rigorously tested uh, and generally uh, published in peer-reviewed uh, journals. Uh, and where they've been replicated uh, in often, in many cases, uh, multiple times uh, and by uh, more than one group. But there still remains, notwithstanding the fact that we now have this toolkit available to us of uh, effective prevention approaches, that there's a, uh, a huge chasm between uh, prevention research and uh, prevention practice, and that we need to do something to bridge that gap. So there's clearly uh, the need for um, more uh, T2 translational research. We're at the very beginning of, uh, of doing work in that area as a field. Um, and it's only by better understanding all of the issues that relate to uh, taking a program to scale and uh, all of the challenges that confront you uh, in the course of trying to translate uh, science into practice that we'll ultimately be able to promote the use of proven uh, and effective prevention programs. So I want to, uh, I know I probably went over a, a few minutes, but I want to thank you all, all very much for coming here today. Uh, it's, a, it's one of those uh, dreary Cornell days. Uh, I've been here enough to know that there are some nice days. Uh, there's some sunny days that occur once in a while. But I really want to thank you all for coming. You've been a very attentive audience. Uh, and uh, I, um, I hope to be back again uh, and uh, hope to be working uh, with John Eckenrode and his colleagues uh, as they move forward with their new Translational Research Center here at uh, Cornell. Thank you very much. Some questions? From the, I'm sure Gil's uh, willing to hang around a little bit. And I know we ran over a little bit, so if you have to leave, um, feel free. But uh, I know we have some very interested uh, consumers of what you had to say. And here's my email address. Questions? I can hear you fine. Ah, that's a good point, yes. Uh, but, but, and one of the greatest difficulties is uh, people can't observe um, why the evidence-based program is better than their home, than their home program. And when I 
and look at agricultural extension at the university, it's much more straightforward. If a new seed is developed and yields a better crop, people make money even in the ensuing year. And, and there isn't the same issue around showing the evidence based on that. It seems to me it's so difficult, uh, you know, a sort of busy agency person whose own program looks as good as anything else and people are satisfied to look 10 years down the pipe to a better outcome. So I was wondering, you know, is there a way, you know, to use the science of persuasion somehow to convince people that things are better than, you know, than their current practice and how we actually do that? No, I think you've put your finger on, uh, you know, a big problem and a significant challenge. Uh, when I first got into the field, uh, there were very few prevention uh, programs, tobacco, alcohol, and drug abuse prevention programs. Some schools were implementing programs, and, and some states even had uh, a certain amount of uh, time that was uh, mandated for those subjects. But over the, uh, the years, uh, certainly it's uh, been true over the last 10 years, uh, we find ourselves in the position where there are, uh, there are a wealth of programs that are being implemented. And you're exactly right. Uh, earlier, the challenge wasn't quite as daunting because you simply had to develop something, show that it worked, and, and then make an effort to disseminate the program. But now, you have to dislodge a homegrown program first before you can convince uh, someone to use an evidence-based program. So that's why, again, we have to uh, do a better job of making the argument and drawing the distinction between evidence-based programs and those which aren't evidence-based programs. Uh, and I think it's a very difficult thing to do, particularly if their homegrown program is something they, they like, they've implemented, um, that may be less expensive than an evidence-based program. I mean, all of these issues come into play. So it's a big challenge. I mean, one way to deal with it would be if you had a surveillance system in place. If, if, if uh, the schools collected data um, every year on substance use, and they essentially had a report card that graded them on uh, health compromising behaviors, uh, and you had these evidence-based programs, then schools, um, if the programs were implemented properly and effectively, then schools would see that there was a difference. But what happens with most of these homegrown programs is they may have some degree of face validity, or at least they, they look like they might have a chance of working. Uh, and uh, um, th there isn't any easy way to compare and contrast one with the other. One has evidence, but they often believe that theirs works. I remember when I first got into the field, um, when you talk to, and you probably have heard similar stories, when you talk to people um, about, about whether or not uh, they're implementing um, a prevention program, they'll say, yes, we've got that covered. We, you know, we're doing HIV, we're doing uh, tobacco, alcohol, drug use. And then you ask them, does their intervention work? Does their prevention program work? Well, they won't have uh, data, they won't have evidence, and so what they'll retreat to is their own position saying, well, I know it works. I see it in their eyes, I feel it in my heart. The kids really like the program, you know, they're really excited. Uh, you know, those kinds of things. And that's been, that was true 30 years ago, and it's still true today. Uh, I also found something uh, that, that sort of relates to this whole issue. Is whenever I have testified before um, uh, legislative committees, uh, including uh, testifying before Congress, uh, one of the things that becomes clear, if you get up there and you're on, on an expert panel, and you're testifying from your expert perspective, and there's a person there, uh, you know, from the community, and they can talk about how one kid was saved, or they think one kid was saved, that just sort of overwhelms everything that the experts say. Um, that talking about the evidence somehow doesn't make the point as well as someone just talking in a, an emotion, in a sort of an, an impassioned emotional way about how effective their program is. So you're right, we have to dislodge programs that are there, we have to convince people not to use what they're currently using. And it's often the case that, that the kind of programs that people think will work, that they intuitively believe will be effective, are the very ones that have been demonstrated to be ineffective. But it's hard, you know, so we have to do a better job of making that case. So it's, an, it's not an easy thing to do. So the very first thing we, we need to do is to figure out how to do a better job of increasing awareness of uh, evidence-based programs, what they are, and why they're important to implement.